Pastor Phil talked about his wife, Joy. Uh, we, we prayed for her. She had to have emergency surgery for her eye. There was like a detached retina situation. Thankfully, the surgery went well. She's doing good. Um, recovering. Praise the Lord. Yes. But because of that, they're, they're just taking some, some much-needed rest this weekend. And um, the guy that I have a privilege to introduce that's going to be sharing with us this morning, uh, is he's a friend to our church, a family friend. He's actually an elder at our church, uh, graduate of Northwestern University. He's a retired NFL linebacker playing with the Chicago Bears and with the Raiders. Uh, if that weren't enough, he's also a University of California master gardener. Uh, I don't even know what that means. It sounds pretty amazing. And if that weren't enough, uh, he's been married for 12 years to his amazing wife, Anna Marie. They have seven kids, one on the way. So you guys do the math on that. Eight kids, 12 years. I, I, I don't really understand that. But um, I'm not done yet. I'm not done yet. Wait, 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 wait. And I think for me, the most, the thing I love the most is he is, he makes the world's best smoked brisket and ribs that I've ever had. So why don't you guys welcome Nick Roach. Morning, morning. How you guys doing? Thank you, Carlos. I'm glad you didn't miss that important detail about the smoked barbecue. It's clearly the most important thing on a Sunday morning. Um, super excited to be here with you guys this morning. As Carlos said, my family and I have been at this church for some years now, and it's just, it's, I can't tell you the blessing that it's been for us um, as a young family and now, you know, being into our, our oldest is 10 and just the blessing that it's been for our kids, like uh, Pastor Daryl was mentioning a few minutes ago. And so I'm, I'm super, um, really blessed to be able to share with you guys this morning. So if you guys want to start turning to Psalm 1 is where we're going to be. Just the first few verses there. And I'm going to be tying this into what uh, Phil talked about as far as depending on God in, that, in the series that we're in on living Christianity. Okay, and so the first question I want to ask you guys today is, if I was to ask you to pick something to describe yourselves, what would you pick? I'll give you a few minutes, to th a few seconds to think about it. I have a, I can't help but laugh at this. I have a friend whose wife used to describe him, for example, as a napkin because of his emotional, uh, lack of emotional flexibility, I guess you could say. Um, you know, I think of for another picture that comes to mind is when I was playing football, one thing they used to, to want us to embrace was to think of ourselves as like a business or like a brand. Um, you know, because the, at the end of the day, the imagery that we choose for ourselves has a big impact on how we then end up choosing to, to think about ourselves and then behave. And so whatever that picture is in your mind, I want you to kind of hold it there um, as we begin to see what God says we are like, the imagery he uses for us, and so that we can begin to line those things up and see, you know, where they, um, just how they match up and what that can do for us or potentially hinder us. So if I could read now Psalm 1, verse 1 to 4, we'll check out the image, imagery that God picks. And I just happen to have here the ESV. It says, blessed is the man who walks not in the counsel of the wicked, nor stands in the way of sinners, nor sits in the seat of scoffers, but his delight is in the law of the Lord. On his law, he meditates day and night. He is like a tree planted by streams of water that yields its fruit in its season. His leaf does not wither. In all that he does, he prospers. The wicked are not so, but are like chaff that the wind drives away. Let's pray real quick before we get into this. Father, just thank you, God. I'm so thankful. I can't help but just but acknowledge how creative your word, that you created everything that we can see and that we cannot see by your word. God, there's power in your word. There's power in absorbing your word and allowing it to transform us and create in us. And so we pray for that this morning, God, that whatever we are all coming here with, uh, whether we are in high moments or low moments, anywhere in between, God, that your word has something to say to us and something helpful for us. I pray that you would speak that now, 
by your spirit's power in Jesus' name. Amen. So like I was saying, um, tying this into Phil's uh, series of Living Christianity, How to Show and Share Your Faith, he has this acronym that we've been going through, SEND. And if you, got, you want to throw it up real quick, yeah. SEND, the S, salvation is everything. E, every believer is engaged. New methods or new thinking. And then depending on God is what I'll be covering today. And so there's going to be two main ideas, really. The first one is going to be submitting to the gardener. And then the second one is going to be embracing our role as a tree or be the tree. Um, and so right now, I just want to give you guys, if there's one main thought, if you leave with no other application today, this is it. Okay? Practically depending on God means making him your biggest influence. I'll say it again. Practically depending on God means to make him your biggest influence. See, this, this psalm that we just read is contrasting the outcomes of choices that is a person that's either being mostly influenced by God, that primarily, fundamentally influenced by God, and they're thereby becoming a tree that has a, a bright future versus somebody who chooses maybe to sit or stand or become uh, in line with the choices and influences that are alternative to God's way, and they end up like shaft that blows away in the wind. Now, why, do, why am I picking this idea of being an influence and why it's important to understand that? Kind of like that picture we were talking about before, the, the concept that we have of our identity has a, plays a huge impact on our behavior. And what I want to say about that, I think about this a lot because my dad is a, is a psychotherapist. I have an aunt who's a therapist. I'm sure there's therapists in here. And it's like, it's actually really well researched and it's pretty fascinating that the type of person that I see myself as has a, a huge, is a huge factor in the things that I end up doing. And you think, like, why does that make sense? Well, think about it. If, for example, I'm somebody who thinks that I'm, I'm loved, if I'm somebody who thinks that I'm wanted, I'm probably going to have very different relationships. I'm probably going to have maybe a different... Um, you know, things that I'm trying to get out of situations or maybe I'm going to have different aspirations as opposed to someone who believes the opposite. Or if I'm somebody who sees myself as a favored son or somebody who is well cared for and desired, I'm probably going to have maybe a different relationship with authority, you know, or I'm probably going to have um, different self-talk that's going to maybe guide my pursuits and my endeavors as someone who maybe feels like they're abandoned fundamentally or somebody who feels that they don't have enough or that they're always clawing to survive. And so the description that we build for ourselves in our minds is kind of like, you know, our life, if our life is a story, what character am I? And what does that character do? That has a huge impact on the fruit of our lives. <clears throat> so this idea about influences is tied to kind of like Phil even touched on this a few weeks ago that like our beliefs lead to our thinking that then leads to our actions, you know, that whole thing, which is which is very true and profound. And so just to expand that a little bit, if our beliefs are here that leads to our thinking to our actions, what is it that informs our beliefs? And it turns out, as I was mentioned before, even scientifically, it's the way that we interact with our influences, with our environments, with our you know, formative relationships, with the cultures that we come from or the cultures that we live in. Um, it's all of those things that become the raw materials for our worldview, how we see ourselves and then how we see everything else around us. And so what we're asking here and what my, the point that I hope that you guys leave with today is that putting God in that spot is, that's the heaviest place where we can put him. That's the most, um, that's the most beneficial place we can invite him into because that then everything comes up and out of that. And so as we think about a tree by water that's fruiting, putting God down at the base of our influence is the key step in the process. First step, obviously, I'd recommend is what are your current influences? You know, maybe if you never thought about before, what, what are the things that are informing how I see myself in the world? What are, what are the things that are 
you know, shaping the way that you see your family dynamics or your role in your family? Or what are the things that are shaping how you view fi your financial situation? Or what, what you should be or should not be or could be doing with your money and your resources and your talents? There, see, there's something underneath the surface, whether you've acknowledged it or not, or whether you've intentionally put it there or not, that's helping to inform how you treat those things and how you use those things. We're asking you to put God there. It reminds me of this um, really profound quote by Bob Goff, who's a, who's a pretty well-known uh, Christian writer. <clears throat> and I love this. He's, he talks about our concept of our identity. And like one of the things that builds it, he says, we'll become in our lives whoever the people we love the most say we are. I'll, I'll repeat that one more time. We'll become in our lives who the people that we love the most say we are. And now I remember the first time I read that, I, I kind of wanted it to say, <clears throat> we'll become in our lives who the people who love us the most say we are. And if you can see the contrast there, I'm thinking if the people who love us the most say we are something, for example, like my mom, you know, like obviously, arguably, she loves me the most. If my mom tells me that I am intelligent, you know, and that I'm tall, dark, and handsome, you know, that I would believe her over everyone else, right? But the fact is, we all know this to be true, that no matter what our moms or that person that, that loves us the most says about us, we still have a tendency to maybe absorb the words and opinions of maybe like the bully at school, or maybe the negative coworker or boss, or maybe the, the friend that just constantly makes fun of you, and you all of a sudden are walking around with something that's not in any way true or helpful, but you've, you've agreed with it to a certain extent because you believe that over what the person who loves you the most says. And so I think what Bob Goff is hitting on here is really profound is that it doesn't matter how much they love us. It's how much we value and we lift up the authority in what they're saying. You guys following what I'm saying here? Because the people that we love the most, the ones that we esteem the most highly, are the ones that we give permission to then form our own opinions. We, we piggyback on those things. And so either intentionally or not, we are giving permission and influence to some voice as it relates to how we feel about ourselves and our things. A voice that's telling us what we believe is true or good or possible. And so the main reason, like I said, I want to jump into this is that it's really fruitful to compare how you think you see yourself or what you see when you look at yourself versus what God says. Um, because the fact of the matter is when you give him authority there, you're now making a monumental impact on the type of person that you present in the world. Because no matter what you see, he's right. <laughs> and so our job is to kind of continue to develop our view, our perspective, our vision, so that it more matches his. I want to go back to just verse 3 for, again, uh, for a minute. Because now that we're talking about this, I want us to understand, like, the first key in this making him our big influence is, is what I call submitting to the gardener. And so verse 3, it says, He is like a tree planted by streams of water that yields its fruit in its season, and its leaf does not wither, and all that he does he prospers. The first observation I want to make, which I think is a huge one, and it, it maybe impacted me the most in terms of preparing for this, is I had never noticed before, and this is a very familiar psalm, you know, for, for people that have read, been reading the Bible for a while, but I've never noticed before that it says this tree is planted. See, I think initially, when I, would, when I was reading this, I had the, the impression that this person, you know, that they're delighting in the law of God, they're meditating on it day and night. This person is doing the right things, is ending up in a good spot because of what they did type of thing. But it's, really, it's not saying that at all. It's saying that there's an implied gardener-cultivator relationship with this tree. Do you guys, you guys see what I'm saying? To pause here, because it's, it's kind of fuzzy to, to depend on God if we're not clear on who we are in the equation versus who he is. <clears throat> if we think that God is the good advice person that tells us how to act so that we get what we want out of life, 
that's all off. This is saying that as I'm being transformed by his words, as, as he is creating in me his perfection by his teachings and by his spirit, that he is then putting me where is best for me, by his power. This is, we're not talking about a chance sprout in this passage either. You know, it's not this tree that popped up. It's an intentional decision by a gardener that, that can see the whole picture. You know, a gardener that knows what's best for me, that knows how to give it, that's uniquely powerful to give it to me. Maybe put it this way, there's, there's something that's happening that's vital to this tree's life and survival and, and pure existence that this tree could not have done for its own self. That, this completely changes how depend on God is our only option in the Christian life. See, we have a cultivator of our lives. We have a gardener in our lives that's urging us and like just, just begging us to allow him to do his thing. This, he's the only one that can do it. It'd be as ridiculous as me looking out here in the parking lot and seeing a tree decide, you know what, I need a little bit more sun or I need a little bit more shade and just hopping up and moving. That's, that's crazy. It's, not, it's, it's ridiculous. So maybe you feel right now for the first time, or maybe you're considering just as you're hearing these words, th this would be the call to action. And I really want you to think about this for a second. The God of the universe, like the, the all-powerful, almighty king of everything that created everything that we can see and cannot see, needs you to let him into your life. He needs permission from you. He made you, and he still is, is so humble in his power to wait for you to choose him, to invite him in. Like, think about the implications of that. You know, if you were here a few months ago, Phil was preaching in Revelation for months, you know, verse by verse about all these things that John is, is being shown, the Apostle John is being shown in the end of days, like all of these unstoppable end time events of how God is going to finish his plan to, to right creation. We, have, we are obviously powerless against all that, but he's given us the power to say yes or no to him. And we've given, he's given us the power, more importantly for you to understand today, you can reject or accept his, his influence in your life, in your personal life. So you may not be able to stop the end of the world, what's going to happen, that, that train that Phil's been talking about, but you can stop him at your front door and say, no, thank you. Or you can open your front door and you can say, yes, please. That, that, is, that is a power. We're the only things in creation that have that power. So depending on God is not this checklist. You know, it's not like, um, it's not a bunch of things that you can do to like prove that you rely on him. You know what I mean? It's not something that you do to qualify as like a follower of God. It's, it's literally posturing your heart to receive the fact that, okay, God, I give you the first right to speak as it relates to my family. I will, I will weigh your voice most heavily as it relates to how I spend my time or how I use my, the abilities that you've given me or my, my finances. I will, I will listen to you before I listen to anyone else, including myself, about my traumas and my imperfections, about my, my soul. You know, it's essentially taking God seriously. Just take him seriously. I think it reminds me of the, the sermon that saved my life. It was, coincidentally, it was another psalm, Psalm 128. And it starts by saying, blessed is the one who fears the Lord, okay? And the, the preacher stopped, and he preached for like 45 minutes on just what it means to fear God. And I remember sitting there, and at the end, he just summed it up plainly, and he goes, fear God. To fear God means to take him seriously. You know, to the, everything that, you don't have to know everything that he says, but of, of the things you know he says, do you live it as though you really believe it? So when you, I'll, I'll ask you the same thing. When you look at your life in every area, 
does it seem like you actually take him seriously on the things that you know, that he says he is like, that you are like, that you can expect from him, that he should be able to expect from you? That definition changed everything because when I first heard that, I could immediately see in my mind the things where I was like, oh, yeah. You know, it was almost like I could see myself as a little dot here and God here. And it was like, well, that, that area, I'm definitely still on top, you know, or like I definitely have not. I kind of know what God maybe wants, but I'm still kind of the final decision in that area, you know. And so it's really this, this active awareness of, okay, God, you're right. You, you do what you need to do, which only you can do on my behalf. So I want to make a connection here just as to why I believe that we can confidently trust God. And so, like, let's jump, we'll jump out of the psalm imagery for a second. And just our physical world. As Carlos was saying, I'm a bit of a plant nerd, okay? Um, Do you guys, have you ever thought about how new fruits and vegetables come to the market, like become available to grow and buy? Like, have, do you think that somebody one day was just like hiking through the mountains and they happened to see like a honey crisp apple tree, like perfectly, you know, just wild and ready to, to devour? Or, you know, somebody was like in some remote village and on a cliff they saw a Roma tomato vine like hanging down and were like, oh, you know, this, there's this perfect thing just out here in the wild. Like, obviously that's not true. It's not what happens. The, all of the, I won't say all. Okay, majority, vast majority of the food plants that you and I consume are, cultiv- are a process of cultivation, meaning that these plants through time have been specifically selected, like observed and bred and invested in and chosen so, with the goal of making some beneficial output for, for the, the market you know, for some, for produce or uh, perfume or whatever it might be, okay? And so, I guess what I'm saying is a process of intention. I'll give you another really cool example. Last year, in one of our training sessions, we got to do a field trip to um, what's called the Citrus Variety Collection up in UC Riverside, and it's awesome. They have, like, if, if you like plants again, but it's, it's amazing because it's literally, tw- it's 25 acres, okay, of a, over a thousand different types of just citrus, meaning like oranges and lemons and grapefruits and literally everything you've ever eaten that's citrus is there and way more that you will never hear about or stuff that you won't hear about for 20 years from now. And it's like, what, what's, and these are not hobby gardeners. These are PhD level scientists, researchers, you know, testing and spending lit, like 30 and 40 years working and, and selecting and observing, testing, blah, 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 doing all this with the goal of, this is the cool part, y'all. Their goal is to just continue the trend, like to select and invest and like find new things that fit our current growing conditions as they change through time, uh, consumer demands that change through time, you know, populations grow and shrink or like, for example, avocados, 20 years ago when I was growing up, we didn't, I'd never even seen an avocado, you know? But now everybody wants to plant avocados. So they're making new varieties that are more friendly for home gardens and just updating what we have options for. Climate patterns is another one as climates, you know, heat and cool, rain changes. And so I guess I'm bringing all this up is that if, if these researchers, okay, you go to school, you know how long it takes to get a PhD? You go to school for 20 years, and then you spend the next 30 years to see a tangerine come to the market. (laughs) Think about that. If these scientists are that dedicated to the next blood orange mixed with a grapefruit, how much more dedicated do you think to your life is the God of the universe who created you? And he literally openly explains that he has a plan for you in his plan to save the world. Do you guys follow what I'm saying here? He's trustworthy, guys. We can, we can count on him to, to put us in that right place. He's putting, it says here, to, to prosper and to, to bring about fruit in its right season. And our fruit, unlike these researchers, it may not be, you know, 
it may not be the climate that we're trying to address, but it could be for the cultural climate, the fruit that we produce, the cultural climate that we live in right now. It may not be consumer demands that we're trying to address and the things that he makes our life revolve around, but it could be the demands of our families or the demands of our communities that he's trying to meet and the fruit that he's trying to bring about in us. So I want to move on. Just now that we've covered some of that about trusting God, why, why it's, it's so fundamental and why it's a, a really good decision at the end of the day is I want to dive deeper into the idea of being compared to this tree, okay, and embracing the, our role as this tree. I want to, there's so much that could be unpacked here, but I really want to focus on this just the idea of being the tree, because Phil mentioned earlier in the series, living Christianity is not as much a doing thing as it is like a finding a state of being. And so as it relates to that, I think it's powerful, guys, to understand that we are being compared to something that doesn't move. We're talking about living Christianity, and we're being compared to something that literally stays in the same place. Like, it's not, we're not being compared to bees and ants, you know, like very stereotypically active uh, creatures. You know, no one has ever graded a tree on how far it gets. You guys don't, you see what I'm saying? But despite how stationary they are, trees in every ecosystem, maybe not underwater, maybe underwater, are the backbone of that environment. You know, like, another, said another way, if you take trees out of creation, out of the planet, life itself is over. Nobody's alive. Nothing is alive without trees. Fundamental to life on Earth. The reason I'm highlighting this is because if you are here today and you're thinking, or maybe you're just becoming aware that you believe that living your faith means accomplishing, or living your faith means, like, getting somewhere, or arriving even somewhere, I give you permission to just rest from that right now. See, depending on God and embracing life as that tree says that where I may not seem to be moving anywhere, I am growing. Even though you don't see me maybe getting to a certain place, I am changing. I am maturing. I am getting stronger. Where, where he put, like being by that living, that stream, means that he has plugged me into unlimited access to his unlimited resources. He's drought-proof my experience because of what he's done for me. Imagine the, the context the early readers are, are seeing this in. Like, imagine trying to grow food like a couple thousand years ago in the Middle East. We have some, I got some family in here right now. They just got back from Vegas. It was 128 degrees. Imagine trying to grow an apple tree, anything out there. See, they, under, they would be hearing this as realizing this tree intentionally put by water is having its life saved. It's having its only opportunity at life being provided. Another thing I think is so awesome about this passage is that the only detail we get about the location of the tree is that it's by the river. You know, like we don't know if it's in a valley or if it's on a mountaintop or if it's in an open field, if it's... We, we, the only thing that we're told is that it's by the river, and I think it's because none of the other details are as important as its proximity to the water. Do you guys see what I'm saying? Then is regardless of where it might be, it's, it's closeness to its lifeline is what we're told. I know that we have a good gardener because he puts us in that spot. And so my question is, for you guys, do you believe today that no matter where you might be, whether you are high or low right now, or whether you are feeling dry, or whether you're surrounded by good things that you could perceive to be good things, that believing God and carrying his word at the base of everything that you believe and think is the most significant trait to describe your location. Wherever you might find yourself, that your 
proximity to your lifeline is the most fundamental thing you need to understand to describe the, the, the outlook of your situation. Let's think about this too. What, what else trees do besides produce fruit? Like it's cool, obviously, this passage is talking about the fruit, but f- trees are fundamental in nature for, they produce most of the air that we breathe. You know, they, they regulate like temperature from extremes, extreme fluctuations. They contribute to the rain cycle. Um, they provide shelter, building materials. Look around, anybody, you know, go home and think of all, if wood didn't exist, what would still be left in your house, you know? Um, how do trees serve this many different purposes? Like, how do they come to be able to provide this many things, this many uses? And so what I want us to do right now is kind of like hear this, hear this, this process that trees go through and hear it double for ourselves, okay? So trees, they receive the sun's energy. We receive the sun's energy. Trees receive the sun's energy, and then they use that power to, to run all their internal processes. So think about what I'm saying is they, the literal light of the world, the light of the world, is what fuels them to be able to develop and serve in all the ways that they were created to contribute in their life. Are we any different, is my question. See, being, exci- being compared to this tree is actually really exciting. Because there's so many that God, so many ways that God has designed for us to be able to contribute and to, like, to bless the world, the ways he allows us to participate with him. And it all starts with receiving what he has for us. I want to take a minute, too, just to illustrate encouragement. Like I said, wherever you are on the spectrum, you know, if you feel like depending on God is something that's a new idea for you, if you feel like you are trying and you really honestly believe that you're doing it or literally anywhere in between, it's just helpful to understand that God sees you wherever you're at and he knows, he knows you intimately, more so than anyone else. So think about this for a second back to the, the cultivation parallel. I'll pick tomatoes, for example, okay, because I love them, and they're very popular. Did you guys know that there are over 10,000 varieties of tomatoes? Over 10,000, that means like, decla- like you could go get seeds for these, or you could buy 10,000 unique varieties of tomatoes. And the cool thing is that each one has a specific name. So you will see names like um, Early Girl, like Black Beauty, um, Shout out Phil and Joy. There's one called Hungarian Heart that I saw. They probably had that. And like, it's really interesting because each one gets a name based on its unique traits. Like what's different about that one than all the ones that, that have come before it. And so it's not that it just gets this name, but the, the person that gets to name it is the cultivator. The person that gets to decide what it's called is the one that's responsible for its development. Is the one that spent the countless hours with it, is the one that has, has sacrificed more on its behalf than anyone else, is the one that gets to introduce it to the world in the way that they see fit. And so what I want you guys to know is that he has good names for us. He has names for us like Masterpiece. He has names for us like favored son or daughter, like tree planted by rivers of water. And like Bob Goff said, if he's the one that, that we choose to value the most and we, he's the one that we give the most authority to, we will eventually begin to believe those things, those names, and then we will begin to produce fruit accordingly. We'll begin to experience the life that's caught up in those identities. And he, he's the only one that can give it to us because he's the one that's growing us. Just like all these freaking tomatoes, 10,000 tomatoes. Like, he gets to put a name on us that he decides because it's his process. The last thing, I think the worship team could probably come up. 
This will be the last few thoughts. As believers, you know, we talk a lot about fruit, which I think is, is right. You know, like the fruit of an action or the fruit of a behavior. Um, yeah, the fruit of situations, and it's, it's really true. But I just want to make sure that, it's, that we're being wise in not counting fruit, not counting an outcome as an end. And what I mean by that is fruit is, is, is an outcome of a process, but it is not the end of a process. See, God designed it so that fruit is an essential part of a cycle of events. It's like even scientifically speaking, a fruit is not a fruit if it doesn't have a seed inside of it. A fruit, unless, unless the next generation is being prepared within it, it's not a fruit. And so I want us to, to look at, guys, we're trying to depend on God and we're trying to live a life that produces fruit as we evaluate opportunities or what's happening or as we anticipate things that we desire in terms of fruit, we need to consider its impact potentially on the, other, the next generation. Who is this? Who am I passing this to? Is there a, an element of bringing up something else to carry this? Is there room for God to cultivate his desires past me? Because if there's no seed, it's not fruit. And so just to round out this picture, guys, as we close, okay, I think this is really important, especially as we want to put all this into action, is that any serious grower of anything, you know, flowers, food, plants, ornamental plants, whatever, they understand that soil fertility is a non-negotiable. And that, like, if you guys have ever been to, like, a, in an old forest, I grew up in the Midwest where there's a lot of, like, you know, really old, old growth force and um, or just a, a really well cared for garden bed if you've ever touched and held um, really good soil it's very dark you know almost a black and really fluffy so what gives soil that quality is a component called the, the humus so you know it's like soil's got it got sand and rocks and things that are not living but it also has a, a living component called the humus and that's where the the plants have their roots in the humus, and they're able to do, get their life-giving nutrients. That's where they basically eat from. Um, and the important thing to know about that word humus is that it shares the same Latin root as our word humility. And so I want to leave you guys understanding that depending on God, as I said, is about a heart posture, not a, a list of things to check that you arrive at a place. And so that as we are thinking of ourselves embracing life as this tree and we send our roots out into humility that acknowledges dependence on God is actually the only thing that we have to turn to. It is all that we need. It truly is everything that we need. But we can't, again, like I said, we can block God. If we are not humble enough to realize, yeah, you're right, God. Even if, even if I knew where the right place was for me, as much as this tree out in the parking lot cannot move itself to where it needs to be, I cannot do that for my own life. I need you to put me where you want me. Believe him. Accept his words at the very core of who you are and, and trust that while... We are not perfect. His plan for us is. Thank you so much for joining us, whether online or in person. We pray that the ministry of Calvary San Diego is encouraging you in your faith. If you would like to follow along with what we are doing or hear more teachings, you can do so by downloading the Calvary SD mobile or TV app. Also, if you would like to partner with us and worship through giving, you can do so at calvarysd.com slash give. Thanks for tuning in.